Greetings and welcome to this MOOC Introduction to Bio-Risk Management. I am your instructor Kenneth and in this first lecture I will introduce you to the basic concepts of bio-risk management. For your information, this MOOC is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International License. You are free to share and adapt the work as long as you meet the conditions of this particular license as stated therein. This lecture has been designed and developed in order to introduce you to the fundamental principles, concepts, terminologies and practices associated with the management of risks posed by biological agents. In this lecture, I have tried to summarize some of the key concepts which are used by biosafety managers. As a biosafety manager, it is essential that you learn all these terms so that you can communicate effectively to your administrators as well as to researchers and other laboratory workers who may need advice on these particular terminologies. For this particular lecture, I have set up specific learning objectives. You will be introduced to the concept of biosafety management and biosecurity management. Both of these are two distinct terms. You will be introduced to the principle of bio-risk management. The concept of containment, both primary and secondary containment. The concepts of biological agents. This will be a brief introduction. The processes involving biological agents and the Biological Toxin and Weapons Convention. Upon completion of this module, you should be able to differentiate between biosafety and biosecurity management. You should demonstrate an understanding of the overall process of bio risk management. You should be able to differentiate between primary and secondary containment. You should demonstrate a basic understanding of biological agents. Describe some of the laboratory processes that involve biological agents and demonstrate a knowledge of the international conventions related to biosafety and biosecurity. Okay, let us look at the overall picture of biosafety and biosecurity. As you know, currently we are in the midst of a pandemic, which is a global pandemic. However, this is nothing new because viruses and bacteria have posed a challenge to humanity for millennia. One of the uh, primary uh, or the well-known pandemics was the 1918 H1N1 virus pan pandemic. So this is basically a flu, an influenza virus designated H1N1 and it caused global mortalities with more than 50 million deaths. Now, what you should be aware of is during that time, there was no way in which the, the deaths could be enumerated on a global scale. So this is just an estimate, but it is a very large estimate, 50 million deaths. It also came at a time at which very little was known about the therapeutic measures such as interferons and other antiviral therapeutic agents. Now we are facing the emergence of new pathogens. These new pathogens have developed enhanced resistance to antibiotics and this is why they pose an increasing threat to human existence. We also have other challenges in the form of synthetic biology and genetic engineering, what are termed as gain of function experiments. These involve the usage of specific genes to enhance the virulence of certain viruses or bacteria. And this can pose a significant threat to public health and safety. And we also have another challenge which comes from bioterrorism. Bioterrorists can utilize biological agents to cause havoc or panic in social systems. And this can disrupt economies on a global scale. So this is an overview of what we are facing today. Now we go on to the next concept, which is biosafety and biosecurity. As you can see, these are two distinct concepts. 
Now, biosafety management focuses on the unintentional release of a biological agent. This can be in the form of an accident or an incident. And the intent is not to cause harm, but rather the result of a lack of oversight and a lack of adherence to standard operating procedures. However, the consequences include a significant impact on the laboratory users as well as the community. And the key term which we use in biosafety management is biological agent. Okay, let me give you an example. For instance, if you are working in a laboratory and you have forgotten to wear the right personal protective equipment, you spill a container containing a biological agent in the laboratory workspace. And this agent gets aerosolized, the laboratory workers get sick. Now, there is no intention of actually spreading this biological agent. However, the laboratory worker has performed an operation which is not in accordance with standard operating procedures. And this is a classical case of biosafety management in which there is no intent to release that biological agent and cause harm. Some of the biosafety incidents which are well known and have been documented are the 2011 German E. coli outbreak. Now E. coli is an enteric pathogen. It occupies your gut and it is harmless. However, if you do uh, ingest a pathogenic form of Escherichia coli, in this case it was Escherichia coli O104H4. It contains a specific gene encoding a Shiga toxin. And once you ingest it via the consumption of raw uncooked food, in this case it was raw vegetable, it can lead to severe complications, mortality and even death. And in this case, 53 fatalities were recorded for the 2011 Germany E. coli OH104H4 outbreak. Yeah, this is a biosafety incident in which case there was no intent to release the organism. However, there was a release of the organism via food. The second aspect of bio-risk management involves biosecurity management. In biosecurity management, we focus on the intentional release of a biological asset. As you can see, I have used the word biological asset. I am no longer using the word biological agent. Because in biosecurity management, the key term is biological asset. And a bioterrorist intends to cause harm to public health and safety. This can also be an intention to create a sense of fear in society. And when we manage biosecurity aspects in our laboratory, it involves the application of appropriate biosecurity protocols or measures to prevent the intentional release of biological agents. This can be in the form of increased surveillance of the personnel and in the usage of physical measures such as security locks as well as inventory control in order to manage your biological assets. One of the famous biosecurity incidents is the 2011 anthrax attack. It was termed as the Amerithrax attack by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the causative organism of this particular attack was a Bacillus anthracis. Now Bacillus anthracis is commonly found in soil and it does not pose a risk to farmers. However, when this particular Bacillus anthracis is cultivated in the lab or cultured under laboratory conditions, it can be induced to form what are known as spores. And these spores are deadly when they are dispersed at a sufficient volume. Now in this particular anthrax attack, the source of this Bacillus anthracis was a laboratory. And a certain laboratory user had decided to spread this anthrax uh, agent using mail. And it led to five fatalities. So the 
the perpetrator actually used the mailing system to distribute this powder in the form of spores and cause harm to individuals across America. And investigators revealed that the cause of this particular incident, which was a biosecurity incident, was related to a certain individual working in the laboratory and his intention to release this particular agent to cause harm. This is one of the many biosecurity incidents which have been well documented and investigated. Now we go on to the next concept of bio-risk management. I am going to bring you in gradually into these concepts. Okay, when does a biological agent actually pose a risk to society? The biological agent in themselves does not pose a risk to society. For instance, Bacillus anthracis is found in the soil. It does not pose a risk to society. However, processes involving biological agents can pose a significant risk to laboratory users and to society. In the case of Bacillus anthracis, the process of cultivating or culturing this virus in a laboratory setting increases the risk as the copy number of that particular pathogen or biological agent increases. However, we cannot simply curtail the process of laboratory investigations because these processes are critical to the development of vaccines, therapeutic agents or diagnostic procedures. Curtailing uh, procedures involving biological agents will be detrimental to science and technology. So we proceed with these processes. However, we focus on mitigating the risk posed by biological agents by the application of pertinent controls. When we apply controls, there is always a certain amount of risk which remains behind and this is termed as residual risk. The respective laboratory users and that organization have to decide whether the residual risk is sufficiently addressed in order to work with that particular biological agent. In bio-risk management, we follow the AMP model and this will form the basis for the rest of the lectures in this MOOC. The AMP model is simply called that because we begin with risk assessment, which is A, risk mitigation, which is M, and performance assessment, which is P. So this process is cyclical. It's continuously improved upon in order to mitigate risks. Risk assessment begins by understanding your biological agent as well as the process involved in the laboratory. It begins by asking a number of questions which are very thorough and exhaustive. And these questions are addressed to their principal investigators, the laboratory manager, as well as the actual laboratory workers working with that biological agent. We need to address the possible risks by referring to prior references or published papers related to that biological agent. We also need to address the facilities. Are our facilities and laboratories adequate? We must address training. Are the laboratory personnel suitably trained to address the risk? And we must address the biosecurity aspect in terms of facility security. We will be covering risk assessment in a separate lecture module. This is just an introductory note on risk assessment. From risk assessment, we move on to risk mitigation. Risk mitigation, as the term suggests, focuses on reducing the level of risk, which is risk mitigation. We apply pertinent controls to mitigate the level of risk. Sometimes you may have to apply more than one control. Sometimes controls may have to be applied concurrently. And this all depends on the risk mitigation strategy of each individual laboratory. Finally, we end up with performance assessment, which is the P 
of the AMP cycle. In performance assessment, you ask questions such as, are the controls adequate? Has the risk of exposure been reduced? Have new risks emerged after the application of controls? Have there been reports of accidents or incidents? How can the biosafety level be improved upon? And all of this is based on continuous quality improvement. So the AMP cycle basically addresses quality, quality of the laboratory biosafety management system. And this quality needs to be constantly improved as newer data comes into the picture. The term containment is very well known to many of us, but we need to look at containment more deeply when we are biosecurity managers or biosafety officers. Containment, as the term suggests, is the action of keeping some, something harmful under control or within limits. And biosafety management is directed towards keeping the biological agent or biological asset under containment. There are two basic kinds of containment. They are termed as primary containment and secondary containment. Let us look at these in the next slide. Okay, primary containment is those controls which protect the laboratory user from the biological agent. They can be in the form of physical containment such as masks, gloves, aprons, or they can be in the form of administrative controls such as standard operating procedures. Now let us look at this particular biological agent which is a bacterium growing in a petri dish and then we have our laboratory users. These laboratory users interact with the biological agent. Primary containment will protect the laboratory users from the biological agents. This can be in the form of specific procedures as stated in administrative controls in the form of engineering controls such as the use of an appropriate biological safety cabinet or in the form of personal protective equipment which is in the form of gloves, masks or other protective gear. Let us look at the next concept which is secondary containment. So in the case of secondary containment, we have the environment to consider. So secondary containment protects the environment and the laboratory users from the biological agent. It can be in the form of physical containment or in the form of administrative controls. Let us look at this. So we have our biological agent in the laboratory, in this case a bacterium growing in the petri dish. We have our laboratory users and we have our first level of containment which you can see in the red circle which is protected the laboratory users from the biological agent. So we have a next level which is the secondary containment. So secondary containment protects the environment in the vicinity of the laboratory from this biological agent. And this can be in the form of a facility, a laboratory facility or in the form of other measures which we will discuss in the lecture on facility design. The term breach of containment implies a temporary or permanent loss of the controls which limit the spread of the biological agent. For instance, if you have a spill in the laboratory and you do not clean it up, you pour down the spill in the public drain, this spill of the biological agent can spread through the community and have consequences for the laboratory users as well as the environment. So in the case of breach of containment, we must apply adequate measures to mitigate the risk posed by the breach of containment. This can be in the form of emergency protocols, which can be resorted to in the case of a breach of laboratory containment. Now I will introduce you to the concept of biological agent. This is a very brief introduction, which is a prerequisite to understanding the following lecture on biological agents. Biological agents are commonly classified as viruses, bacteria, fungi, prions, 
genetically modified organisms and also biotoxins. Viruses can cause significant harm as the recent pandemic has proven. Bacteria can cause harm as well, especially the antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria. Fungi can also cause harm when they spread via spores. Prions are misfolded proteins which are quite rare. However, they can cause a significant threat to public health and safety. Genetically modified organisms are another class of organisms which do not exist in nature. However, genetic engineers have modified these organisms and these can be a significant threat to public health and safety. And finally, you have biotoxins. Biotoxins such as ricin can also be used by bioterrorists to cause harm. So we must be aware of all the biological agents when we work in a laboratory facility. There are certain international obligations which nations must adhere to in order to comply with biological safety. One of the most widely cited regulation is the Biological Weapons Convention. The Biological Weapons Convention was designed or developed to limit the usage of biological weapons in the form of biological agents or toxins. And Article 1 of the Biological Weapons Convention states that each state party to this convention undertakes never in any circumstances to develop, produce, stockpile or otherwise acquire or retain microbial or other biological agents or toxins, whatever their origin or method of production of types and in quantities that have no justification for prophylactic, protective or other peaceful purposes and weapons equipped or means of delivery designed to use agents or toxins for hostile purposes or in armed conflict. The Biological Toxin and Weapons Convention was effective on 26th March 1975. There are 183 parties which are, have signed this particular convention and they all intend to comply with the Biological Toxin and Weapons Convention. This also brings us to the term which is DURC or Dual Use Research of Concern. Dual Use Research of Concern pertains to those biological agents or toxins which have dual use. They can be used in a benign setting as for instance pharmaceutical compounds or also as toxins and weapons and this forms an entirely different class of biological agents which I will discuss in the following lectures. Please be aware that your specific national laws may limit the use of biological agents or biological assets in your respective countries. Please refer to the specific biosafety laws in your national regions. You may also have to refer to laws pertaining to genetic engineering as genetic engineering also encompasses biosafety management and biorisk management. You may also have to refer to specific OSHA or occupational healthy and safety laws in your respective jurisdiction. Your national guidelines may also contain specific standards pertaining to biosafety and biorisk management. So all of these have to be taken holistically in order to address the issue of biorisk management in your respective jurisdiction. This brings us to the end of the first lecture of this series. To summarize the first lecture, we have looked at biosafety and biosecurity management and examined the difference between these two aspects of biorisk management. We have looked at the principle of biorisk management in terms of risk assessment, risk mitigation and performance assessment. We have looked at the concept of containment in terms of primary and secondary containment as well as the breach of containment. I have also introduced you to the concept of biological agents and the concepts 
associated with them. We have also looked briefly at the international conventions on biosafety and biosecurity. I hope this lecture has addressed some of the terms which you may have encountered in the past. We will be revisiting all these terminologies in the following lectures. Thank you very much for watching this video tutorial and I wish you a pleasant learning experience. Thank you.